Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Hello from the same studio, this time at the third discussion as a part of uh, a cycle of our virtual debate about the future of cities brought to you by the Association for the Development of Industri Industri Infrastructure, British Embassy in Prague, the Association of Municipalities of the Czech Republic and Czech Invest. As I mentioned already during previous debates, please do not hesitate to ask, do not hesitate to give us questions. You can uh, also send your questions uh, to the email address uh, uh, and we will monitor your questions and try to ask for them or we'll uh, catch up uh, with you later. Here with me in the studio, uh, I have uh, David Petter, the head of uh, um, <coughs> business uh, localization at Czech, Visvest, Czech Invest and Michal Bavic, uh, the head of the Railways Department at the Prague office of Mot Mot McDonald. Good afternoon. And online with us, we have three British uh, panelists. So this time we have three uh, panelists from the UK. One of them is Professor Andrew McNaughton, the um, <coughs> chairman of the board of Network Rail High Speed. Uh, welcome, Andrew. And the other uh, is Joe Baker, uh, the advisor for Great Cambridge Partnership. And the third is Brian Matthews, the head of the innovations in department de in the transport department and Milton KS. I am Tomasz Janeba. I'm the president of the Association for the Development of Infrastructure, and I will be moderating this debate. Uh, today we want to inspire uh, uh, you and show you practical uses of uh, 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 case uh, practical case uses how uh, we can uh, uh, approach uh, climate changes in uh, in relation to transportation and we want to present the experience from the UK first we will hear a presentation about tram trains which is a, a solution how to approach uh, 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 carbon footprint uh, in relation to railway station a tram train is a sort of two in one solution which uh, behaves as a tram for uh, some time and then at other times it behaves as a train. The second presentation will present uh, uh, transportation strategy until 2030 for Greater Cambridge and the third presentation will focus on the future of interconnected transportation services in Milton Keynes. So, uh, this was the introduction. Now I would like to uh, uh, pass the floor to Professor Mac uh, uh, Norton, uh, the uh, advisor to the British government, uh, uh, who works also on the project network rail high speed. Uh, as I mentioned, Andrew is the uh, uh, chairman of the board of Network Rail High Speed, an organization that operates the railway infrastructure and operates also HS1 connecting uh, London and uh, continent. Continental Europe in mm, uh, 2009 and 2007, until 2070, uh, Andrew was in charge of development of High Speed 2 uh, railways. He was responsible for the strategic proposed design, for technical specifications for EIA, and also for selecting the corridor for the uh, line. Now he is a special advisor for the Australian and, as I heard, also Japanese government for high speed rail. And uh, since 2019, he has been been also the advisor uh, for the Czech Republic. He uh, uh, participated in uh, the uh, drafting of the strategy for high-speed rails in the Czech Republic. And today he also teaches at the uh, University at Southampton. In his presentation, as I mentioned, he will uh, present the tram train uh, uh, concept and we will see whether this can be an inspiration for Czech cities. Andrew, I pass the floor to you and I am looking forward to your presentation. Dr. Den, I'm Andrew McNaughton. Um, I'm sure I will have met some of you in Prague over the last few years. Uh, talking about high-speed rail across the Czech Republic. But today I want to talk about the opportunities around rail transport to transform the cities in the Czech Republic uh, for a world, a sustainable world, a green world in, in the decades to come. So I'm going to talk for a few minutes about affordable, low-carbon, 
rail development to serve green cities in the Czech Republic. Now we have to think, what are the mobility challenges of those cities? These are cities which many have a great past, but they need a great future, a post-industrial future. These are cities reinventing themselves as regional centers of services, health, education, and of employment in modern manufacturing, in modern jobs. But many cities around Europe, and I don't think the Czech Republic is any different, whilst the cities themselves often have good city transport, trams and the like, they're very walkable cities, the access to them from the surrounding areas can be quite poor and is almost always very road-based, a very 20th century approach. And whilst there may be existing railway lines, heavy rail services don't serve terribly well the places where people want to live in the future. They serve where industry used to be in the past. It would be nice to just build completely new rail systems everywhere, but they're incredibly expensive and they're just not justified. I want to talk about more newer thinking that says, let's use the best of light rapid transit. Use what we can, what I call upcycling the existing rail network to provide a green transport for the future. You might say, why not just use buses and cars? We already have roads. But just remember, car ownership is a significant cost, particularly for lower wage employees. We, people assume that road electrification will be easy, but it's not going to be easy. There are challenges. And even electrified roads or road transport does nothing for congestion. The cars use up just as much space, whether they're powered by petrol or electricity. Don't forget, the, the manufacture of car batteries is a very high carbon um, process. So your electric car comes with a carbon footprint bigger than you probably realize. It's not going to be easy to allow charging infrastructure access for people, especially those who live in apartments. And the electricity generation infrastructure may need to be prioritized towards heating and supplying homes and industries. Transport can't assume that electricity is a free and easy solution. Even electrified road transport still brings air quality problems. Most of the particulates that affect young people's health in cities comes not from petrol fumes, it comes from rubber tires running on asphalt surfaces. Again, a good reason not to base our future on road transport. Light rail, whatever the cost of electricity, light rail uses less of it than the equivalent uh, road transport. It is more energy efficient and energy is not going to be cheap. There's a final point. When you develop a new line, a new rail line, people look at it and go, this is forever. This is going to be here. We can confidently build industries, build businesses, buy our houses, because we know it's not going to go away. It's not going to be shut down easily. So the potential for tram train, light rail, to reconnect people with city centres 
is much greater than perhaps people have realized. Now, this isn't new. Let's be clear. Back in 1992, well, 30 years ago, in Karlsruhe, people showed that it was safe to run a tram-like train on existing railways, mixing with heavy freight and mixing with high-speed passenger lines. Why did they do it then? It's because heavy rail didn't serve the city well. It brought people from surrounding districts into a main station that was not that close to the centre, to the shops and places people needed to go, shops and businesses. That city centre station was actually over a kilometre away from most places. What they did in Karlsruhe was realise that if you connected the trains to the tram system, you could run tram trains through from surrounding districts and serve people directly into the city centre. You reconnected the surrounding towns with the centre of the regional city. Now, a few years later in Kassel, there was more original thinking that built on that. On the face of it, it looks quite similar. It is a, a regional train that can share the city tram network, that can run on the main line network safely and uh, effortlessly, and it can use self, its own power to go on to rem more remote branches. It doesn't need to have electrification everywhere. Because it's lightweight, it is quite practical to use some battery technology in the 21st century to get either into sensitive town centers or to go on remote lines. Remember I said heavy rail tends to have relatively few stops and it serves places that were important when the railways were built 100 years ago or more. Tram train allows you to build new stations where people actually want to go to and from on, on the same basic rail infrastructure. And because tram trains are light and energy efficient. They accelerate quickly, they stop quickly. And in Castle, it, they could show you that they could build more stations and still give the same journey time. It was like having a lightweight sprinter rather than a heavyweight boxer transporting people. Those additional stations, of course, could be very expensive. And again, one of the good things that they showed in Castle was that additional stations could be really simple and they could be very low cost. And basically, you could build a station wherever a road and a railway came together. And here's a, a very simple illustration. It could be at a bridge or it could be at a grade crossing where the railway crosses the highway. Simply by putting in a little low-cost platform, putting in bus stops, putting in walkways between them, and a few um, simple uh, shelters against bad weather, it was possible to create at each of these crossings what was effectively a transport interchange but a transport interchange that was utterly affordable. So let's recap. Because these are light tram trains, they accelerate and they brake quicker. You can get more stops serving more people in the same journey time as with heavy rail, which means more access for more people, more use to society. There is also a benefit to the railway operator. 
because light trains do not damage the track so much. It means there's less maintenance. It means there's less cost. Actually, that can translate into a lower cost system for passengers as well as funders. Now, in Britain, we took this learning and created in the north of England, in Sheffield, a pilot project in 2018. The purpose of this project was to reconnect a rather run-down town called Rotherham with the city of Sheffield, which is rapidly being regenerated as a city of modern manufacturing uh, and uh, of education. We took the learning from Germany and we demonstrated that we could start on the Sheffield City tram system. We could then run out onto a mainline railway in between trains that operate at over 160 miles, uh, kilometers an hour with a tram train which can run at quite a reasonable speed at 100 kilometers an hour. It shares this track, as I said, with long distance uh, passenger trains and with freight trains. It then goes on to a secondary route, and that's the picture just on the right hand side, where we built some new stations. Very simply, you can see just a little bit of asphalt for a low floor platform, easy to access built for very little money. And finally, it ends up on a little bit of new street track in the center of Rotherham. That's at the bottom of the picture here. So it's taking people from where they previously didn't have easy access to the jobs, to the employment, to the entertainment, to the health and education facilities of a big city, even though they were only 20 kilometers away. We proved the safety and the practicality of a tram train system in Britain. Our plans are now far more adventurous. In the northeast of England, there are a whole network of towns that have suffered in the last 30 years from the closure of old industries of coal mining, of steel making, heavy industries. These are cities and towns which we now see doing the new manufacturing of things like offshore engineering, of things like smart infrastructure. But they're towns where there are people with skills but they don't have easy access to the new centers where these things will be done. There is a heavy rail system. It was designed to carry coal and steel. It is almost useless in the 21st century for people. It was good for what it did. We have been looking at how to use that system in the same way that we've just talked about in Sheffield or in Castle, to create a network of lightweight tram train routes that give people easy access to the main city, which is down on the right-hand side here, called Middlesbrough. Middlesbrough today has got a main station but it's not that close to the new center. And there are very few regional stations where people can get access to the train in the first place. When we build the Tees Metro, as we call it, light rail tram train will give access from a whole no load of new low cost stations not just to the main connecting station from where you can get to the rest of the country, but with a small amount of new street um, infrastructure into the heart of the city itself. 
we see this as absolutely pivotal to regenerating not just the city of Middlesbrough, but all the towns around it in a way which is low cost and very green. Let me then recap for you the advantages of this kind of approach. The most important thing to remember is it's a way of connecting more communities with a regional centre. And that strengthens the regional centre as more people can gain access to it. It gives you both the economic growth and the social inclusion. It's affordable. It makes greater use of existing railway routes without having to rebuild them completely. It enables us to build new stations where we need them very simply. It enables us to build into town centres as if it was a tram rather than as if it was a heavy railway, railway and therefore uh, available to do that as well. Yes, it's dual power. You don't need total electrification. If it's a heritage town or there's just not the business case to do it, you can run a train, a tram train with a battery. It doesn't cost much to operate. It really doesn't damage the infrastructure. And it's green. It has a lower energy demand than heavy rail, and it has a much lower energy demand than the equivalent capacity of road transport. Because it takes cars off the road, it improves congestion in the city. And because those cars were rubber tired, it improves the air quality that those city dwellers experience. In short, light rail tram train supports sustainable 21st century cities at an affordable cost. That's what we're doing. And I really believe in the Czech Republic, there is a great potential to do this in a number of regional cities across the country. Thank you very much for listening. I look forward to the panel debate. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you for a great presentation, which is very inspirative for us, and we will discuss it later on uh, during the panel. Thank you very much. I would like to continue with the next presentation. The next presentation will be presented by Joe Baker, uh, who is an expert uh, working for the Great Cambridge Partnership, uh, 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 which is implementing an investment package for Cambridge City deal. deal. We met with um, Bay, uh, Joe when he worked for the British office of Mott McDonald. He had 35 years of experience in urban playing and transportation. He has experience with projects in Great Britain, Europe, uh, Middle East and Far East. Uh, in the past, he had it uh, uh, significant initiatives by the European Commission, such as Cupid Network for setting prices for the use of road, uh, Tropical Network Plum for the research of use of land and transportation and Jupiter 2 focusing on uh, clean uh, vehicles. He was also part of a team that created ELTIS uh, team, the teacher center of the European Union for uh, monitoring urban mobility. Uh, so John, uh, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to present to you today. I'm very sad that I cannot be in Prague with you and not have the opportunity to see some of my friends in the city, but I hope that very soon I will be able to come and visit Prague again and maybe present in person one day to say more about what we're doing. My name is Joe Baker from the Greater Cambridge Partnership, and I will talk a little bit today about some of the transport projects we're delivering in Cambridge to work towards a more sustainable city. So, as I say, I will present the 2030 transport strategy for Cambridge. So what is the Greater Cambridge Partnership? The Greater Cambridge Partnership is the local delivery body for a city deal between central government and the local government authorities. 
It brings powers and investment worth up to half a billion pounds over 15 years to deliver vital improvements in infrastructure. It supports and accelerates creation of 44,000 new jobs, 33,500 new homes, and 420 additional apprenticeships. Hopefully some of you will have visited Cambridge, but for those who have not, where are we? It's a historic city around 40, 50 miles to the north of London. Traditionally, the city was dominated by the university, which has created a strong knowledge economy. And in recent years, there's been rapid growth of what's been called the Silicon Fen, uh, an area of high-tech industries, biotech startups that have grown rapidly and proved very successful. In particular, we have the headquarters for AstraZeneca, who of course have been of great importance during the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic and a very strong associated biotech research industry around that. That success, however, has highlighted the limited supply of housing in the area. There's a population in the wider area of around 200,000 200, people, but there is not enough housing for those. And much of the work we're doing is to provide the connectivity between new housing areas and the jobs people wish to access. So what are we doing? The transport investments in the area include four new bus rapid transit corridors, 12 greenways, which are what we call our rural cycle schemes, which connect the villages around Cambridge into the city. Also new urban cycle schemes to connect the greenways to the different destinations within the city centre itself. We're researching opportunities for demand management in order to reduce car traffic by 15% and also raise revenues to fund the improved public transport that we need. And finally, we're providing support to Smart Cambridge, which is providing work on future solutions. And I'll come back to some of the um, innovations that we are looking to pioneer later in this presentation. The programme as itself is set out on the map on the right. We're looking at an integrated programme, which is for our target year of 2030, that brings all of those different schemes together with the existing infrastructure. So I say you can see in red, the high quality segregated routes for electric buses and active travel. We're looking to upgrade the key radial routes, including bus priority, cycling and walking. There are a range of new cycling routes and upgrades to the existing network, which you can see in the, the light green um, dotted lines around them here. And travel hubs at key locations on the routes into the city centre, which enable people to leave their cars and proceed to the city by bus, or as an alternative in some cases, because cycling is very popular in Cambridge, to cycle from the park and ride sites into the city centre. Finally, the area in yellow in the centre is what we call the city access area of the city centre, where we're looking potentially at the combination of demand management and improvement in public transport services. So the headlines we're looking for, one of the most important things for people is to really transform the bus network. In the United Kingdom, as many people will be aware, our bus services have been privatised and are not regulated. So they're run by private companies um, and those do not necessarily reflect fully the um, aspirations of the population. So we're looking to a more integrated form of public transport network, which may have greater level of coordination from government to ensure the sorts of services we need and the sorts of key performance indicators we're looking at are for rural services that all the villages should have at least one bus per hour that may not sound ambitious but in many cases they have far fewer than that and some villages have no public transport services at all and those services should link to stations and other key destinations the major mar market towns the larger villages should all have six buses now so effectively you can turn up and be confident that you'll be getting a bus regularly and having the option of express services to provide quick access to the city. And there will be more direct services to employment areas, again, with a bus every 10 minutes in the city. Um, we're looking to speed the buses up through the provision of bus rapid transit corridors and also looking at mechanisms to reduce the fares and make it more affordable and more competitive to use public transport compared to driving at the moment. Unfortunately, it's often cheaper for people to drive, particularly if they travel in groups or with their family. So we're looking to address that and get more 
um, rational and sustainable travel choices for the population. So the bus network, as you can see from this plan, is going to be quite radically transformed with the, the blue area being the key bus route corridors in and around the city, and then the green feeder services from some of the outlying villages to link into that network from areas which maybe don't have much public transport at all. And again, also to provide accessibility to all the different railway stations in the area as well. So quite a different level of detail of transport network compared to what we have had so far in the city. The next area we'll look at, which I've touched on, is demand management. Transforming the bus network in Greater Cambridge and making fares cheaper is estimated to cost around £40 million per year. And that money needs to be found in order to achieve the changes. In addition, to make public transport, cycling, walking attractive, reliable and fast, we need to cut congestion, we need to free up road space for more public transport services, and we need to make the city attractive for cycling and walking. And we need to raise the money to invest in those services, the lower fares and the improved walking cycling routes. So we need to look at alternative mechanisms to try and do that. And at the moment, we are looking at a number of different opportunities. We're considering a pollution charge where you charge vehicles to drive within an area unless they meet set emissions criteria in terms of limiting the emissions from the vehicle and maybe the carbon consumption associated with it. Um, at the moment, that could be an effective solution. But as we move forward with the take up of hybrid and electric vehicles, that will be less and less effective because most vehicles would be compliant and therefore would not be impacted. We can look at higher parking charges, increasing the cost of parking or introducing a workplace parking levy, which will be a, a yearly fee for parking spaces that organisations provide at their workplaces. And that's something that's been done successfully in the UK city of Nottingham. Or we can consider a, some sort of flexible charge where we charge private vehicles to drive within an area may be varied by time of day or day of week. And again, that reflects some of the work that's been done in the city of London um, on the well-known congestion charge there. So we've got a number of possibilities to consider. We need to think about the hours of operation. The area might be covered by some sort of system. What the impacts could be, ensuring that there are people who need urgent access to destinations, particularly, if, say, the doctors and nurses working at the hospitals to make sure that they're not disadvantaged and we need to think what sort of charge might be costed. And that's some of the work which is ongoing at the moment, as well as consultation with the communities to get their views and try and make sure that people aren't adversely impacted by these proposals. But that's work that we're doing right now. In terms of the bus rapid transit schemes, at the moment, we already have a bus rapid transit scheme that runs north to south through the city. That's a curb guided system and you can see the bus is running in a concrete channel. You can also see in this location that with planting around it, although it's a concrete channel, it, it's, not, um, it's not that visually intrusive. Um, it means that the buses can travel at a reasonable speed and the driver does not necessarily need to, to steer the bus when it's on the curb guided busway. That's been operational for some years in Cambridge. It's a solution which has been adopted elsewhere, both in the UK and abroad. Um, but I think there is a desire to look to the forward, to the future, particularly because Cambridge is very much a city associated with innovation and development. So we've started the process of looking at what other technologies are out there. There are solutions um, in a couple of places on the continent that are using optical guidance. And you can see here the um, broken white line along the road. These vehicles use a video camera to follow the white line and automatically steer the vehicle. So it's as if it's following a track, but the reality is there is no physical track, just the white lines and a video camera. And we have done some initial trials on this technology, and we will be taking these further to see if this is the solution that we can apply to our bus rapid transit schemes. As you can see in this instance, which is in um, Castellan in Spain, these vehicles are trolley buses. We don't have proposals for trolley buses in the UK at the moment. We will be looking at conventional buses but they would be electrically powered. So in terms of what we're actually doing entering the delivery phase of our works, we've already been making progress. Um, we've been implementing a range of cycle schemes already. That's an ongoing process. And one of the things we have been doing is learning from some of the examples, particularly from the Netherlands, 
where there are alternative models of roundabouts, which give real priority to cyclists over and above traffic. They have what we call Dutch style roundabouts, where the um, cyclists can drive around the edge of a conventional roundabout, or what we call here the, the Cyclops Junction, with traffic signals in the center, but a route around the edge, the red line that you can see on the plan, um, which is used by the cyclists and the pedestrians. So effectively, they have a fully segregated, fully controlled route round that makes it safe for them to move. Again, similar to what is found in the Netherlands and places like Denmark and Belgium as well. So it's quite a big shift from the UK um, that we have, I think, the first Dutch style roundabout and the second Cyclops junctions in the UK and Cambridge. We are going to be building certainly more of the Cyclops junctions, we believe, and we will be studying those carefully to see how they operate and how we can learn from that process. Um, what's really important is thinking around that hierarchy of road users, cyclists and pedestrians coming first, then public transport and then cars. And that's a, a really big shift from where we have been working many, for many, many years. We've also been looking at e-mobility. Um, you, you can see in the background a docking station, which is used for um, hired bicycles and electric scooters. It's quite a simple structure, but it, it keeps them nicely tidied away. We'll be looking to roll out trials like that, but hopefully done in a managed way. Initially, as has been the case in many cities, some of the e-mobility solutions like hired bicycles were delivered very much by um, private sector companies without too much regulation. They weren't necessarily particularly successful and they weren't great in terms of their impact on the city. You can see um, cy cycles from a previous scheme lying around. Some of those were stolen or dropped into rivers. And we're now looking at a, a better organized way of rolling out some of these measures. We are already starting on our bus and cycle schemes. This is the recent opening of a new pedestrian and cycleway across the river that bisects Cambridge. Um, that will form an important north-south route through the city, linking the railway stations and the greenways, the routes in from the villages, will all correct, connect into this spine so that there's a way that if people come in from one village, they can use the, the spine route we call the Chisholm Trail to connect them then onto the ongoing routes. And I say this, this was just a photograph from the opening section of the bridge, which was one of the key pieces of infrastructure that, that unlocked that route. Sometimes delivering these schemes is challenging. The reality of, of really changing a street, you can see here a very conventional looking street with houses on both sides. We want to change those streets. We want to create a, a priority for buses and cyclists. That involves quite a lot of work um, to be done. It's not always easy. And you can see the nature of Cambridge where these are relatively old houses close to the street. So it, it's sometimes challenging in technical terms to deliver the work in and around the electricity supply, the fiber optic cables, the, te the telecommunication cables, and trying to make sure that people can still get around safely while we're working. So it, in sometimes it's a slow process to get these works done. We can't work on every street at once because whilst one street is, is quite disruptive, we need to keep other streets open, but we are slowly making progress as we work our way through the city. And the aim is to provide quite a radical program over a period of years that will change many, many streets and many routes, moving the emphasis again away from the private car towards public transport and cycling. As I mentioned before, the buses on the new bus rapid transit schemes will be electric powered. Um, this is one of the first two fully electric buses that we've got in the city, but we now have funding for another 40. So all of our park and ride services and some other services will be soon fully electric powered. We hope that's really the starting point of a complete transition of our public transport system away from the diesel vehicles towards electricity. And that will hopefully resolve the problems we have of air quality in the city. Again, for those who don't know Cambridge, this is a very typical view. You can see old buildings, very limited pavements, very limited space. So people who are walking are very, very close to the vehicles and where there is air pollution, it's difficult for it to escape. So it's really important to find ways of reducing the impacts of public transport. We've restricted a lot of car movements already in the city. So the pollution that is there is very much related to the bus fleet and the taxi fleet. And it's very important that we clean those modes of transport. 
And finally, we are looking to the future. Cambridge is a city associated with research and innovation. We are looking at trials of fully autonomous vehicles. At present, it's not legal to use these on public roads in Cambridge, but last year we did undertake a trial of this autonomous shuttle that worked on land owned by the university and ran successfully connecting car parks to different branches of that university campus. We will, alongside our other work, carry on looking at how innovations like this might help us think what the future of transport looks like, but that shouldn't detract from the work we're doing to make sure that over the next five or 10 years, we significantly improve connectivity from where people live to the places where they want to live, work, where they want to be educated, um, where they want to go for leisure, shopping, things like that. So we hope we've been able to give you an idea of some of the improvements in Cambridge, and I'll be very happy to um, take any questions during the discussion section. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comprehensive presentation of Greater Cambridge Project. Thank you very much. Um, questions will follow during our Q&A session. Now we'll have the last presentation. It's pre-recorded, I must admit. Now we have slight issues with a connection to Milton Keynes, but we've got the presentation and we'll see whether Brian will be able to participate in the panel discussion. Good afternoon. My name is Brian Matthews. I'm Head of Transport here at Milton Keynes Council. My role at the Council is to explore new mobility solutions to help the city grow and develop. So I wouldn't mind if it's all possible to spend the next few minutes telling you about some of the things that we've undertaken here in Milton Keynes, how we've developed uh, future mobility solutions, and some of the lessons learned. Milton Keynes is a new city. It's grown over the past 55 years from basically Greenfield site in the southeast of England. The city has now grown to a, a population of close to 300,000 people, and we forecast to increase the size to nearly half a million people over the next 20 to 30 years. These are exciting times for Milton Keynes, and really puts us at the centre of a growing development arc between Oxford and Cambridge here in the UK, that puts us at the forefront of growth and development for both the local economy and the national growth of the UK. But that, of course, puts tremendous pressures on the city as it grows, particularly around mobility. And we want to develop the city in a way that's sustainable and supports the ambitions and lives of all our residents. So, as I said, my role is really to explore how mobility can develop to support these ambitions. When we look at the future of mobility, uh, our starting point was really to look at a timeline, a timeline where we, where we expect development to uh, go along in pace uh, with the development of new technologies. So the diagram at the top of the slide shows you a timeline, our estimation, of how new technology will develop over time and support the growth. And as I say, my role is really to unravel the route we are taking to uh, develop these technologies and, and have them uh, developed and deployed within the city to support our growth. So if we're looking at the diagram at the bottom, what we're really looking at is uh, developing a transport system that enhances the, the role of the car but looks to decarbonize it by taking uh, uh, the fuel, uh, i.e. diesel and petrol, out of the scenario and changing those to electric. So we have a massive electrification program that goes alongside many of our activities. The second element is really to look at the same, same role as uh, large vehicles, buses. So again, developing clean fuel buses to support the city and to support the growth of this important mode of transport. The next areas are really looking at uh, some of the things I'll, I'll look at in detail in this presentation around how we're looking at connected vehicles, autonomous vehicles, 
and how this can enable greater sharing of, of, of resources and assets to mean that we don't use as many vehicles on our roads as, as we currently do. So really, it is an ex exploration of connected autonomous vehicle solutions to support the growth of the city. The approach we've been taking in Milton Keynes is really to open up the city as an urban laboratory. We feel that by doing this, we learn in the field, within the city, with real people, how some of these solutions will develop over time. And what we see on the slide here is a number of examples of how we deploy these new services in the city in a testbed scenario to really understand the contribution they can make towards uh, the city's development. And importantly, how our public react to these, these solutions and what benefits they may, may accrue from them as they are developed. So going along on the slide, what we've explored recently is the use of drones, uh, uh, air mobility, to establish whether that has a role to play in urban environments and indeed connecting to some of our rural communities. Uh, we've also explored a range of connected and autonomous vehicle solutions across from very large vehicles to completely autonomous shuttle vehicles, uh, taking the people around the city uh, from point to point, to more specific adapted transport, such as the pods uh, around the city, uh, that really supports the first and last mile solutions I think we're all striving for in our city to enable us to get more accessibility to places that currently are perhaps inaccessible or very difficult for some people to get to. We're also exploring new technologies that means that the, these, these solutions are, are fit for purpose for all. So in our wireless charging uh, experiment, it's particularly looking how this technology of charging vehicles uh, can be made easier for our residents and, and motorists. You're not handling cables, and this might be a benefit for the less able. It also has a business benefit of making the, the charging experience easier and, and supporting car share schemes. And we have a range of connected and autonomous services within the uh, city, and I'll come on to those in a little bit more detail in, in further slides. But the picture I've missed out in this description is the one in the centre, and this is around 5G technology. The fit, city is very advanced in its thinking in developing this capability to support a lot of these mobility solutions. And I'll describe a little later in the presentation how we've applied a city scale network to help develop, promote, and support some of these mobility solutions. So why automation? Um, it is clearly something that, that, that's not quite ready for deployment yet, but what we want to explore in our environment, in our urban laboratory, is some of the potential benefits uh, and explore if they're real or how we realize them uh, early so we get the advantages. <clears throat> So it's very much objective driven in, in what we're looking at. So particularly around safety, um, we have learned through much research and, and exploration that uh, the safety record of vehicles is very much influenced by the driver. And 90% of accidents are through human error, not machine error. So if we can eradicate the, some of the decision-making that perhaps humans are not very good at, then the advance of autonomy may make our roads safer. Capacity, uh, we're all aware that our roads are getting more and more congested. And that partly is down to the human behavior and how we drive and the space that we have to leave between vehicles and our reaction times to, to changing circumstances. So again, if we take this out of the equation and allow automation to take over in certain circumstances, could we squeeze more capacity out of our infrastructure and allowing vehicles to travel safely closer together? A third area is a, a very important one for the city is around the mobility ability, uh, the ability for our residents to, to get around the city. Uh, we are learning that we have an older generation, more and more older people are being active longer into life, through their life, and maybe they they lose confidence in being able to drive a vehicle themselves. So again, by giving this level of automation, can we support people moving around our city more and more? And likewise with disabled disabilities, taking out some of the complications of driving, 
uh, could allow more people to be mobile uh, for longer. And this supports a better quality of life for many of our residents. So very important to us as the city develops and grows. And of course, productivity, uh, the fact that we are driving vehicles ourselves, often in congestion, slow journey times, could we use the time more productively and actually do something else while we're being moved around? So it's similar to if you work on a train or read, the, read a book on a newspaper, can you do that in your personal vehicle? And again, this enhances the quality of life of our residents and allows them to get to between places refreshed and ability to, to work at work, uh, <clears throat> not having undertaken a very difficult journey. So again, these are the benefits. And we're not quite certain they're all there, but it's only by doing these trials that we understand uh, what, what are real and how they can be realised. But of course, none of this would be possible without the support of our residents. And it's very important to us to understand the attitudes of this new technology, these new solutions, and how people respond to them. And we felt it was very important to do this very early on, to understand uh, current feelings, current uh, views of this mobile uh, transport, and then be able to use that information to respond to it, to ensure that the services we develop are fit for purpose and will support not only uh, our residents in getting around, but perhaps support better business cases, business opportunities to deploy the services. So very interestingly, in a recent survey that was undertaken, not just in Milton Keynes, but nationally and internationally, we very much found that the, what we, we, a phrase we use, the jury is out. No firm decisions have been made yet. Uh, there is a little bit of polarisation that a few people say, definitely not, not, not interested in this new technology. And a few people say, yes, it, it's something I'm prepared to use and really support. But the large majority in the centre haven't made their mind up. And so it's, about, it's important to us that we develop and test the technology so we can understand it and promote it and address some of the areas that people are telling some of the areas that the reasons why they've not made the mind up and make sure that we hunt on a, a, a smooth route to deploying the technology. Also, we learned from, from our surveys, and, uh, and these were very in-depth, covering many thousands of people, that the use of uh, autonomous or connected vehicles is unlikely to be very different to the way we use vehicles currently. So again, they have the, the purpose behind them to support mobility. And again, an underlying theme that came through our public attitude service is as more people become familiar with the technology, then greater the trust is grown. And we learned this specifically in Milton Keynes because we have deployed these vehicles for periods of time for over three years. And as we've seen them deployed on our networks, more and more people are coming across them, getting to know them, and ultimately trusting that the technology does work because we've got an incredibly proud safety record that we've had no major incidents and they're working to plan in terms of the technology. Although saying that, they're not perfect. And I will go through some of the learnings we found and how we've started to address those. One of the themes that we, we looked at this in, in terms of the technology is to ensure that we work very closely with the technology providers, the manufacturers, the development developers of these systems. So very, we, we've coined this phrase that means that we're trying to adapt the transport to our current city rather than the other way around, having to change the city to fit with the mobility solutions. So it's a city-led initiative that's really look at the forefront of le learning to how the vehicles can operate it within current environments so you don't have to have the investment or change the city that people currently enjoy and like the form of. So it's very much a partnership with the technology companies, with businesses to create the opportunities for uh, these vehicles to operate in the city. And that's what we found through our public attitude surveys is having that partnership approach, engaging with our residents is clearly very important to developing successful solutions going forward. I'll give a case, uh, an example of that with, this, with the deployment of uh, uh, autonomous robotic delivery service. Uh, the, these are uh, from a company called Starship. 
And just over three years ago, we worked with Starship to deploy a, a very small scale trial of the vehicles, not really understanding what benefits, if any, they had. But again, on this approach of using the city as a, a test bed, a laboratory, we're willing to invest our time and effort in understanding a little bit more about them so we could make some decisions later on and how we would deploy, if at all, the service. And it was amazing, the, the results we got. We were, we were very uncertain to begin with uh, whether they had a role to play in a, a modern city. But what we found was that they were taken to the community's heart. They, they were really very well received because they delivered a valuable service, something that residents could recognize as enhancing their lives and supporting their everyday activities. It was about um, quality of life and supporting people that didn't need uh, to drive their car to fetch, fetch some goods. They found that inconvenient and having one of these robots deliver the goods in a very quick time uh, supported their lives. And what we've seen over the past three years is that the growth of this service into 200 vehicles, devices operating around our city. They serve the whole of our community of around 50,000 homes. So there's one close to you every day of the year. Uh, and what we found is that through their traveling of 700,000 miles in that period, they've taken an awful lot of cars off the road because 70% of the journeys that was undertaken before the robots were taken by a car with a single person in going to the local shop to collect goods. And clearly that has a, a wider benefit in carbon reduction, reducing the risk of accidents, supporting the local economy. And very recently through the, the pandemic that we've all been through, they've supported essential deliveries and supported people in their homes. So this is a, a really interesting and successful trial. And really what I'm trying to get over is the point that it was only through trialing and developing and supporting and learning and working in collaborations with the developers that we were able to unlock this benefit. But saying that, uh, I'll try an example of where it didn't quite work for us and what we've learned around this and what, we'd, what we're now doing uh, to rectify and support this a little bit further. So the, in, in 2018, Motor Kings deployed a fleet of around 20 of these vehicles, these pods, four-seater pods, to operate under a last mile service within our city centre. What we found was the technology worked pretty well. It was able to navigate around the city safely, but unfortunately it was at slow speeds uh, because there was a high mix of uh, pedestrian cyclists you know, on the same networks. And we required a safety driver to be in, in the vehicle at all times because we couldn't guarantee information coming back from the vehicle to a control center to operate them service uh, safely. So that means that the speeds are very low, so not attractive as a viable transport option for many. Uh, it was labor intensive, and therefore there was no real business case developed the, to push these forward. Uh, we were satisfied the technology worked and safe, but it needed a little bit of a helping hand to take it that step further uh, to deploy as, deploy as a service. And again, this is what we've learned through opening the city up as a, a testbed urban environment. So that what we consider there to, to address this problem and understand it a little bit better is if we could have a, a better level of connectivity, digital connectivity, better surveillance and security of signal. And what we explored with, again, a range of partners with the role of 5G technology the new, new system available now, coming on stream now, to be deployed to support these mobility solutions. But the problem we faced is that the mobile network operators were more interested in developing the services to serve co uh, commercial consumer goods ar around uh, your mobile phones. So the city took a brave decision to deploy a network that was owned and operated by the city specifically to be used for the development of new products and services, particularly around mobility. And this is what we did over the past two years uh, to get the network up and running. So the network delivery was supported by the UK government for the Department of Culture, Media and Sport, 
and also our local uh, trade association, CENTLAC, which is a local enterprise partnership. And through funding from themselves and indeed industry, a, a true collaboration between the public and private sector, we're enabled to build a full network across Milton Keynes uh, that provided the 5G uh, connectivity to all areas of the city. And this was connected back to a data exchange. So all the data and information we were gathering through this network could be analyzed and developed and used for a variety of purposes, uh, including the de de development and deployment of mobility solutions. And what we've brought this together is, is a very unique proposition that's currently live and ongoing at the moment, is to deploy this, this capability, this technology, at a very large site within the city, our, our main sporting arena, which is a, a, a football stadium. But that stadium is supported by a range of developments, so it's a very active area with lots of trips, lots of activity. And could we use the technology to deploy all the services that you've seen on previous slides to operate in combination to, to mimic and develop what might happen in the city centre of the future? And as I say, this deployment is ongoing at the moment, and I'll be able to share later with you access details of, of how you can see and get involved in this, uh, this, this project. But at the moment, this is all working live and we are seeing now the benefits of how the service integrates with the wider community. And how we're using it is not just for mobility. As I said, the capability of 5G is such that it can create uh, new ecosystems, new business opportunities. And we're particularly interested in how this is deployed to support energy management, uh, how it's deployed to support health services, so it's a true project that can help develop the city as a test bed going forward. So specifically within the stadium environment, the use cases we have operating at the moment include at least four forms of autonomous vehicles, a large shuttle vehicle transporting people from our railway station to the stadium site, a fleet of pods moving various people and goods around the site, around their, their business, and particularly, uh, it's been supporting hotel guests, which is a large hotel on site, uh, taking their luggage around to the right areas of the hotel outside because it's a large external uh, campus type environment. We've also deployed a pod that undertakes security surveillance, again, an important facet on the site. And also something that's unique for us in, in Milton Keynes, a teleoperation, a robo-taxi, where the vehicle is driven remotely uh, to where a customer might be waiting for it. The customer then drives and uses the vehicle as we would normally do. And then the vehicle can be automatically repositioned to the next, next customer, again, using assets better. So this is a tremendous uh, experiment for us, and we're really thrilled with some of the results coming out of it at the moment. And if you are able to follow a link to MK5G Create uh, using the Google search, you will see some of the exciting things we run up to here in Milton Keynes. So really that, that was it to cover what we've been up to in Milton Keynes. I think the key message that we'd like to pass over is, is use your city, take, take the lead in many of these things to deploy uh, new, new mobility solutions to support your local ambitions, your local objectives, and don't be afraid to, to work in that partnership. Uh, and as I say, take the lead, stimulate the market, stimulate the business, but at all times recognising uh, that your citizens, your businesses are very important and representing those in, in the conversations you have with the technology and new mobility providers I think is important to, to grow the success of this new revolution in mobility. So thank you very much for listening to me. I hope you found it interesting. And at the bottom of the slide is my contact details, and I'd be more than happy to respond to any questions or comments or share further information if you should uh, so wish. So once again, thank you very much for listening.
Thank you, thank you, Brian, for your uh, presentation. Well, I already mentioned that we uh, pre-recorded this uh, uh, presentation. Unfortunately, we uh, did not succeed to re-establish uh, connection with uh, Brian. Also, I should say that we have been promised already twice that um, the Minister of Transport, Martin Kupka, would join us, but unfortunately he is still at a parliament session, so we'll see whether he will be able to join us uh, later. Uh, 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 those of you who saw in uh, the uh, presentation the Milton, that Milton Keynes is testing a space shuttle technology, this was a an error that uh, we made uh, during the translation. So uh, the shuttle actually refers uh, to a land transport, not a space uh, uh, transportation. So let's uh, continue with the debate. I hope that we'll be able uh, to connect with uh, the panelists. I would like to welcome again uh, David Petr and Michal Babic. Michal Babic is uh, the technical director of the Rewas department at uh, Mott McDonald. He is an engineer with 25 years of experience in the Rewas sector. He has also participated in the preparation of the strategy for Czech high-speed rail. And uh, currently, you also work on the development of the railway junction Prague. Uh, so, uh, and you, David, are uh, uh, the head of the business localization at Czech Invest. You is, are specifically uh, responsible for uh, development of uh, brownfields. So we might mention this uh, topic you are uh, searching for new uses for brownfields uh, before that you worked for five years as a consultant uh, during preparation of uh, several large uh, projects uh, in Czech Republic and abroad uh, in Prague in Bucharest in other cities and you uh, graduated in uh, transport engineering in the Prague Technical University so I'll start with the first question Mick Michal, we saw a presentation about tram trains. Does uh, the word uh, is the word uh, tram train known in the Czech Republic? Do we have uh, something like this in our country? The term tram train is something that every uh, expert will understand, but we also have a Czech word for it, vlako tramvaj which uh, is basically a word-by-word -word translation of this term. In the Czech Republic, we have projects like that. We have about 10 of them, and probably the best known to the public uh, uh, is uh, the uh, uh, project in Nisa, Nisa project in uh, Jablonec region, but as I know, none of this uh, project is currently in an implementation phase. All are in, a, in the project design phase. We had some projects in cities, in agglomerations, but also a project near uh, Lipno Lake, which is a, a, resi a recreational area. Thank you. Well, I also would like to ask a question. I have a question for Professor uh, Andrew. And the question is, uh, what is uh, the difference be, uh, between a tram train uh, and the train and a tram? So what is the major difference uh, for just someone who is a lay person? Put very simply, to the passenger, it's got the comfort and the facilities of a proper a proper train. Um, toilets, good seating, luggage racks, cycle spaces, Wi-Fi, air conditioning. But it is, its its structure is of a tram that's been strengthened sufficiently from an engineering point of view to travel on the main rail network. And that gives it its, so think of it as a crossover between the two. When it's out on the main network, you would choose it as a modern train, but it takes you right into the center on the tram tracks. It's that ability, to cross over between the two 
established technologies that makes it so attractive uh, for passengers. Uh, thank you, thank you very much uh, for your explanation and I now will have a more technical question for my colleague Mr. Babich. So what is the difference uh, in the uh, um, uh, track superstructure for, for tram train? What is the difference if you compare it to a tram or a train? As Andrew already mentioned, it combines two systems. Uh, the public usually focuses on whether the track has the same gauge. Uh, but this uh, paradoxically is not the main problem. We are able to build a track with uh, two dimensions. We just use, use uh, three rails and each pair then uh, uh, creates a different gauge. And what is more uh, challenging is the shape of the head of the rail and uh, its uh, geometry uh, in relation to the wheel of the uh, rail vehicle or uh, a tram. So it is uh, difficult to find a combination. Uh, it is difficult also to uh, choose uh, slides which are there are different uh, technologies used on uh, railways and on tram lines so these are technical details that you need to address when you want to use such a solution thank you i will pass the floor back to tomas now andrew uh, would you like to add something uh, we discussed uh, the size or the gorge uh, of the track and uh, would you like to comment on this? Um, the only thing I would say is that when we have got into this, with a, particularly in cooperation with the people in Germany that first worked it through, uh, these are a number of these are a number of technical issues which can be overcome relatively simply, and a number of manufacturers have created tram train designs. Uh, from my experience in the Czech Republic, you have manufacturers uh, in the Czech Republic who are perfectly capable of producing a tram train. So in presenting this as a, as a possible solution to the many cities in the Czech Republic that need something with higher capacity than just a bus that have got older line railway lines that are underused i genuinely think there is a great potential to do something for many cities as i said in my presentation at a cost that you can afford Thank you. Uh, one more question about this uh, concept, about that design. Uh, could you, Andrew, comment about uh, its uh, potential in the UK? On the slides we saw that there was another project in preparation. Uh, and uh, uh, p what is the potential maybe in other European cities? Uh, we're seeing at the moment um, Actually, you asked that question uh, only a month ago. A number of city authorities in France, Germany and Austria got together to um, specify a tram, the same tram train that runs on normal gauge uh, tracks um, so that they could go and put together a big order uh, at, again to, to get the advantage of uh, a standard tram train. Uh, those are city regions such as in Germany uh, near Stuttgart, uh, in Saxony, uh, Chemnitz, um, in Karlsruhe itself on the French border, and then two city regions in Austria, which is very easy for you to go and see and talk to people, uh, Salzburg, uh, and the Linz regions. So that tells you it is the cities with maybe under 100,000 people um, where 
building very expensive new heavy railway is not credible. Uh, it is these kind of European cities, mid-sized cities, of which there are a considerable number in the Czech Republic, uh, who are now ordering tram trains and reusing their older railway network and exploiting their tram systems or building new tram systems uh, to, to do the things that I talked about in my presentation. So I think you're seeing, and this is where I'll finish, I think you're seeing tram train really taking off around many medium-sized cities across Europe. So it's uh, great uh, to see that uh, this uh, concept works, that it's spreading around Europe. So we'll see whether we'll see more Czech cities adopting it. I have a question for Joe. Is charging for car traffic in city centers uh, uh, something that will be necessary in the future? If we want to uh, limit uh, individual car transportation in centers. So do you think this will be necessity so it's important to be clear that in cambridge we haven't yet got a firm commitment to, to doing this it's something that we are consulting on at the moment but i think also something that across the uk we are recognizing is that as there is a move towards electric vehicles the fuel taxation that pays a significant contribution to the highway system will disappear and so there will be a need for an alternative source of funding from car drivers to pay for the infrastructure that they use. So that's one clear economic argument, but also for Cambridge in particular, we have a very congested city and a recognition that there is a problem to be addressed that we cannot easily solve. And also there is a real concern that we don't have enough public transport services and we need to be able to fund them. So I think also from that point of view, it probably is a necessity, but we are still consulting on this at the moment to decide whether it's something that, that will be adopted. Thank you for your reply. And what about Cambridge population? What is their attitude of people from other cities and municipalities in the UK there where they already charge for individual cars? I think, as with any city, um, there will be people who are not keen on the idea of charging for the use of the car. But there are also a lot of the people in the city who are concerned about air quality. They are concerned about congestion. And Cambridge has a very, very strong cycling orientation. So for many people, they cycle around their city and they want less traffic to make it safer. I think it's important also to say that um, other cities like London, when they introduced a congestion charge, people were very apprehensive beforehand. And then afterwards, it just became part of the way the city worked. You, we, we all pay for car parking now. It, it, it actually is no difference to maybe paying for car parking. But there's a psychological barrier that obviously people don't like the change. Nobody likes new taxation. Um, and as I say, we are doing further consultation, um, which will happen before there's any decision made on this. Thank you, Joe. We had a question to Brian, but Joe promised he would try to reply. Looking at Milton Keynes, are you aware of any problem with transport in Milton Keynes, or is it just the fact that Milton Keynes has become a city lab for the whole UK? And perhaps in the name of the presentation we saw the term new town what does that mean in case of milton keynes could you explain that to us so I, I don't speak for milton keynes but from um obviously my knowledge of the city what i can explain is milton keynes is um fairly unique in the uk it is a completely new city it was created just over 50 years ago um just out of small villages so again, very differently to most UK cities, it has much more of a grid style network, um, big highways with big roundabouts connecting the big highways on a grid system, each part of the city in one of the squares of the grid. So it risks being very dominated by the use of the car because unlike cities like Cambridge, it has enough highway infrastructure to accommodate a lot of cars. If Milton Keynes is gonna address environmental goals, 
then it does need to look at fairly radical solutions. And I think that has been a big driver to push for innovation in Milton Keynes, along with a lot of industries based there who obviously are keen to contribute. So um, it is, it's, it, it's, it's addressing a different type of problem perhaps than many other cities, which is that if they don't find alternatives, it will become a car dominated city. Thank you. Next question, Andrew and David. Andrew, to what extent the economic development of a site is related to the functioning of its, of its transport system? If I just say a few words, I can't, uh, I, I see it is essential if any brownfield city region or site is to be developed to its potential, it needs to have good access. People need to be able to get to it. Um, and in the 21st century, that means more than just private road transport. But if you, if you can't get to it, it will not develop its potential. It's essential, is my view. I fully agree with you, Andrew. Transport connection or link is always the first thing that must be solved. Almost every investor has the same question who arrives in the Czech Republic. They keep asking what's the connection of the side of the whole region. They are even interested in the wider area, highways, high speed rail. At the same time, well, when we go in detail, they are interested in good serviceability because only by good links, good connections, we can spare costs. Ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome unexpectedly Martin Kupka, the Minister of Transport. Minister, welcome. We are very glad that you are here with us. Thank you very much for your time. We've been discussing transport systems and how they can help develop cities. Can I pass the floor on to you, Minister of Transport, Transport Development, in your opinion? Hello. Good afternoon everyone sorry we can't see each other in person to discuss a very important topic transport i dare say that the time is almost up um, the situation affected by war in ukraine is uh, a very important moment. We have never lived through anything like that. And we'll see whether we'll be able to react to the changes and whether the transport infrastructure, logistics, public transport is ready for such an impact. I believe there where there are short connections with functioning public transport, resilience to major impacts of the Ukrainian crisis will be lighter. And that's my starting point. The steps we did in the past led to short distance places where it is easy to choose means of transport that are suitable and not limited to private cars only. And it's been always related to s use of smart systems, map, uh, smart maps and coordination to be able to react to the existing needs of the area. And that's exactly the way how to ensure for the future and not only in relation to public transport to ensure how people will travel, what would be the cost related to the transportation, if it's going to be healthy or not, how to create 
preconditions for that. This has ne perhaps has not been uh, the emphasis at the Ministry of Transport, but I hope the Ministry will um, be able to share good experience with the world, to inspire, to develop new urban projects. A good, a well-developed city is based on proven principles, on the principles of short distances, and I hope we'll be able to engage state-of-the-art tools, IT, information technologies for people who decide to move from point A to point B to offer them the best conditions possible. We hear that everything must be adjusted to service as a to transport as a service. We are no longer expected to own a car. We shall share it. Everything will be green, etc. Well, transport has never been based on dogmas and ideologies. And in my opinion, a good solution for the future and for transport too is to take this lesson from the past. Not everybody will be happy with sharing a vehicle. Not all people will perceive transport as a service, but people should be given the choice. And the purpose of public administration is to expand that offer and to let people choose, choose the way that they perceive as the most suitable and reasonable one. And we should also try to use state-of-the-art solutions. We should try to develop public transport uh, that is cost-efficient, that um, is e effective and provides convenience to the public. And if we manage to do that, then there will be more passengers, their numbers will increase, and there is no need to put pressure on them to regulate them. They will automatically choose the new, most convenient way for them. Um, transport should be able to offer many attitudes, many approaches based on state-of-the-art knowledge for the widest possible spectrum of people. That's my commitment. Also, when an investment by the government is needed, then the purpose should be to achieve not only the highest cost efficiency possible, but also the top quality available. That's why we emphasize good urban solutions, also in terms of railways, all new projects, new minor stations should be based on architectural con contests so that there is enough quality, quality in terms of urban solutions. That is always at the beginning and that will determine the possibilities given to local people to move around their city and where they like to continue to live. So I believe my contribution uh, is in line, in harmony with those of my uh, colleagues. We hope that we will be able to provide transport to the widest possible spectrum of people, not ideologic, and that will meet the demand of people who are in need of it. Uh, minister, uh, thank you very much. I think that we agree with a lot of what you've said. Just for your information, we uh, are connected with Andrew McNaughton and Joe Baker from Great Britain. We also saw a presentation from Milton Keynes, which is an interesting uh, a small city that uh, uh, serves as an urban laboratory. Andrew McNaughton uh, mentioned uh, tram trains, uh, which is something that uh, we would like to introduce uh, to you. And uh, Joe Baker uh, mentioned about or described uh, uh, how uh, a historic city of Cambridge uh, 
redesigned since uh, transport solution to accommodate also increasing a number of people that uh, travel to the city. I hope that uh, the information that uh, will are mentioned here during our session will be interesting for you. Uh, but anyway, thank you for participating uh, with your contribution. And if you have time, please uh, participate in also in the panel. You are welcome. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, I uh, will have to return uh, to the meeting of the uh, government and we will be discussing a number of issues, uh, also including uh, issues relating to transportation. I am uh, sorry that I cannot spend more time with you, but I will be happy to uh, listen to the outputs of this uh, conference. Uh, and I will also uh, uh, view the uh, contributions uh, from your uh, uh, participants from abroad. Thank you. Thank you uh, as well and goodbye. Gentlemen, let's uh, continue with our uh, debate. Uh, David, well, uh, I would like to follow up on this. I would just uh, like to briefly add that uh, you, uh, uh, that I also agree what was mentioned by Minister of Transport. I would like um, to add maybe that the uh, uh, solution that we choose for our cities is based on the ability to uh, uh, be able to uh, well plan uh, to prepare uh, good plans uh, for land use etc so this is something that has to be uh, linked also with the development of the transport system but uh, if we want to continue in our discussion I have a question for Andrew and then also uh, for Mr. Babbage whether it is uh, still worth building a larger urban rail systems like the S-Bahn in Berlin uh, today and I would also like to ask whether most uh, of the advantages now aren't actually on the uh, lighter uh, modes of transport such as uh, trams, uh, or, uh, railways, in, in investing in railways may be very uh, costly I believe. So what is your opinion on this? I think there is limited opportunity to build and develop new heavy rail S-bahns. I can imagine uh, around Prague, because it is such a big city, the capacity that a high that a heavy um, railway brings may be um, useful. But Everywhere else in the Czech Republic, the size of cities and the capacity, the number of people that you need per hour to travel, the capacity, the passenger capacity, would put you in favour of a much lighter solution. And Tran Train gives you that lighter solution that goes into the region beyond the limits of a conventional uh, city tram network. Thank you. I would like to ask you, Michal, whether you would like to comment on this or add something. Well, definitely it is not possible to say without any considerations that one system is more advantageous than others. Every system has to be designed for specific conditions, especially rail systems have to be fully adapted to what are your requirements. That means the speed at which you want uh, to transport the passengers, the number of passengers that you want to transport. So again, you cannot generally say that one or the other system provides more benefits or makes a better sense. As uh, Andrew said, uh, Prague is a large city. We have uh, commuters uh, from the area of around 50 kilometers. And uh, if you would, you would, if if you wanted to use trams for this, it would trams for that. It would not be a solution. Prague, by the way, is uh, uh, developing its uh, tram system quite quite extensively.
family and often uh, people refuse to use it because or sometimes they refuse to use it because say uh, it's a nose noisy mode of transport and they see other negatives so there is no easy solution you cannot simply say that a tram a train system is a solution uh, that fits all situations uh, so I agree that you need to, to consider all circumstances thank you gentlemen Joe uh, question uh, for you and uh, for the uh, great uh, Cambridge uh, program and also Milton Keynes uh, how are the investments in great uh, Cambridge uh, uh, finance this is finance mainly from the uh, uh, county budget or do you get uh, some uh, funding from the government uh, some national funding or do you use some private capital in 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 greater Cambridge we are funded by what is called a city deal and there are quite a lot of similar models like this up and down the country where the government has agreed an investment program with a city or a region or perhaps a, a, a rural area to to provide certain amount of infrastructure in return for a defined amount of funding it gives greater certainty rather than bidding for money year on year it gives certainty to invest over a number of years in infrastructure and other um, activities um, so that's the funding we work with and it's it's in place in quite a lot of areas particularly the major metropolitan areas in the city um, we have some private investment in this but it's mainly because our program unlocks land for housing development and the um, developers of those sites provide significant contribution for the infrastructure that we're providing we don't have a ppp bfi style model in the schemes that we're looking at at the moment thank you joe I have one more uh, question about uh, Cambridge. Uh, uh, Cambridge cre clearly relies on uh, bus uh, services uh, and uh, the segregated routes will uh, probably take some space that is used currently by cars and clearly the cost of developing a new, s new bus uh, network will be quite high. Uh, did you do an analysis of uh, uh, these costs and compare it to other uh, scenarios? So taking the first question, um, the routes that we're putting in are a mixture of segregated and on road. Obviously, the segregated sections don't impact on the highway network, but some sections of the route do. And we very much see it as being important that we don't just provide public transport, but we are consciously think looking to reduce the capacity for car transport um there is a, a strong recognition of the climate crisis in cambridge and need to move away from where we have been for so many years and say that we will reduce the amount of room for the car if needs be there will be more congestion for car drivers because if we are to address the climate crisis there must be less car traffic and we want a city that is really good for people walking and cycling. So again, in terms of the hierarchy, it's about non-motorized use. It's about the, the, the walking, the cycling, the public transport, and only then about the car. So it's quite a different way of approaching um, transport in the city. And yes, the cost of the new bus network will be substantial. Um, we believe it's worthwhile. There is a lot of debate, particularly about the impacts of COVID. And yes, we are doing a lot of analysis around the alternatives in the uk we have to do a business case for any investment so there will, there'll be a comprehensive business case that considers all the alternatives but even though at the moment um bus usage is at about 80 percent of the level it was before the covid pandemic we see it as just m m even more of a strong case for investing in making the buses net better to get people back onto public transport and out of private cars. Um, it's particularly in Cambridge because it's such a constrained historic city centre. There really is very little scope for car usage in the city centre, um, which, which is perhaps unusual. Um, but so we, we do feel it's, it's definitely a, a worthwhile investment. Thank you, Joe. Now from uh, Cambridge, we will uh, go back to Prague. I have a question for Michal. 
in the content in the context of the approach of British cities uh, to the organization of uh, transport does uh, Prague really encounter its uh, spatial limit because we've had examples uh, that mention that Cambridge is a historical city with narrow roads, narrow streets, so that it is very difficult to accommodate uh, traffic. And we in Prague, we often hear that we do not have enough space in uh, streets. Uh, we do not have, we cannot segregate individual types of uh, transport because of this uh, spatial constra constraints. Uh, is it really true or uh, uh, do you think something else? Prague, of course, has its limits, including spatial limits. It is a historic city, and you cannot keep on adding more and more, more modes of transport, whether this is an individual transport or uh, even public transport. Public transport also needs uh, some uh, transport route capacity to allow smooth operation. And uh, I have experienced mainly with the railways. Uh, so as far as railways are concerned and the railway network uh, is concerned, uh, the uh, uh, Prague uh, basically has no more capacity left. It is difficult to bring more trains into the center of Prague. Now some, uh, uh, some routes are under reconstruction now, but this central area is very difficult zone and what we developed uh, quite recently 10 20 years ago are at the limits of their capacity and we need to start thinking about developing more infrastructure you use the word excuses well you should realize that the city and we saw it in all presentation is the objective or is the um, final destination, this is where people want to get, this is where uh, goods uh, need to get, and as part of its efforts uh, to make transportation sustainable, the city expects more from railway transport and relies more on railway transport. But if you want to have short uh, intervals between uh, S-Bahn trains, if you want to transport more goods, then of course you need uh, uh, infrastructure for that in the city. And uh, what is difficult is everybody will tell you, yes, of course we want to have sustainable rail transport, but nobody wants to create conditions for that. Now, uh, many former, uh, many, many brownfields formerly used uh, uh, for uh, railways as a railway uh, for railway purposes. Now they are converted into something else. Uh, but also, uh, railways need uh, some areas uh, uh, for development. So we cannot say that everything be located uh, far beyond the city limits. Uh, so. Uh, land planning, which you mentioned, is extremely important. It is extremely important also, uh, not only in terms of developing a uh, railway infrastructure, but also in terms of protecting uh, the land that are next uh, to the uh, infrastructure. Uh, although rail transportation has been considered uh, uh, a very sustainable mode of transport, it still has some impacts on its uh, surroundings and people are often against uh, uh, for the development of railway infrastructure. Often uh, what would be extremely helpful would be to uh, plan 
well to do good land planning, not uh, to allow some develop uh, residential uh, projects near uh, uh, railway tracks. Uh, then when somebody wants to, uh, if you build a residential complex next to a railway line, then it is very difficult to uh, expand that line because obviously people who are living next to it are against it. So we should have all these things in mind when we plan, when we do land planning, urban planning. Thank you. Uh, I would like to ask you, do you, would you like to mention some specific projects that uh, uh, Prague uh, plans to implement uh, soon? Mott McDonald uh, is leading a consortium of companies that work uh, that work on a, a feasibility study called uh, a Railway Junction Prague. You can go to the road uh, rail infrastructure uh, management uh, or rail infrastructure authority to their webpage, and you can find a document about it. This is a strategic document for the period between 2015 and 2017. This may look uh, far ahead, but uh, for a project for, for a project of such a scale, this is not so far ahead. And uh, the objective is to bring high-speed uh, transportation to this uh, transport hub. So uh, this transport hub would, or this junction would uh, connect high-speed uh, trains with other types of trains. It would also uh, strengthen uh, suburban traffic uh, that is used for daily commuting from uh, the areas around Prague, from Greater Prague, uh, from various directions. Kladno, Lisa nad Labem, uh, and other uh, uh, towns around Prague. All these uh, suburban trains have to have a place where to arrive in uh, the center of the city. And the third area on which we focus uh, is how to uh, also develop sufficient capacity for freight transport. Because uh, uh, part of the freight transport has uh, to go to, to the city, yes, it has to use uh, these rail lines, and if we uh, uh, limit this transportation only to some night hours, then um, uh, we would not be successful. The tra freight transport would move completely to roads, but because it would be not uh, acceptable for the uh, 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 carriers. Uh, so this is also something on which we focus, and we will be focusing on this uh, for another at least 18 months. Great, thank you, Tomáš. Andrew, I'd like to use this opportunity um, that you are here. Let's move a bit faster from light tram trains. Let's go to high speed rail. The Czech Republic has been preparing 600 kilometers of high-speed rail. And this is not about rail. This is to make distances shorter. This is to reduce time needed for travel. High-speed rail is an opportunity for Czech towns too. Would you please share some experience with us from the UK? Would you have uh, any kind of recommendation for Czech cities how they can use high-speed rail? Thank you. Thank you. This is a, a very big subject, so I must just say a few words on it. First, from the experience in Britain with my railway, connecting towns and cities which were remote from major cities like London, has transformed their economic behavior. It's got them close enough, close enough in time 
rather than in kilometers. It's got them close enough to the big city regions that people can get good paid jobs. People in those cities can uh, move out to the more attractive, smaller regional cities. It has enabled those cities to grow economically and it's enabled them the people in those cities to be not left behind so it's it's improved social mobility as well as economic wealth the plans in the czech republic to me do exactly the same thing they connect up the major city regions to avoid the risk that in 50 years time, Prague, which is a major European city, will be wealthy, prosperous, attractive, uh, congested, and the other cities will be left behind. It will ensure that the whole of the Czech Republic prospers rather than just the capital city. That's the point of high-speed rail. Then the point of city transport, as we've been talking about, and as Michael has said, is to ensure that within the city region, people can get easy access to the places they want to go to. So think of high-speed rail as the same as city transport, but on a country-wide basis, if that makes any sense. Thank you, Andrew. Let me add that it's a major thing for the development of the Czech Republic when we think about Uski nad Labem region, Karlovy Vary region, those economically challenged areas awaiting transformation. If we have fast connection between Prague, Uski nad Labem, Dresden, Germany, it's a game changer in terms of attractiveness for investments, for example, that is covered by or tackled by Czech Invest. We perceive it as a huge opportunity to attract investors and to support economic growth in the regions where we try to provide support but without quality transport connection we cannot be successful if i may add to that not only prague and brno are concerned our system of high-speed rail is called fast connection and it will also serve smaller cities smaller municipalities such as jehlava and havličku brod and what's definitely interesting is that uh, railway stations will become a gate a point where people will enter a town so any development will focus on how to integrate train and further connecting mobility in town so that it works well together michal yes you are right in the past 30 years ago when there were first uh, signals of rail high-speed rail we dis we thought sort of it as a ground airplane a fast bullet you know starting that started somewhere was launched somewhere and landed uh, at a different place now the concept is different yes we are building a backbone line high-speed rail but it's rather the principle of high-speed road trains travel very fast to a certain point and then you can continue to smaller regional centers where people want to go and from where people go to major cities so that's the major uh, change in thinking of uh, transport experts engineers when compared you know to the beginnings of this process
myšlenkově, ideově připravuje takto. I'd like to add, we discussed zoning, zoning plans. We've moved forward uh, in terms of preparing high-speed rail, but what I am missing is the connection to, you know, surrounding places and connecting nodes and junctions. We need to deal with that now. We need to prepare the area for new investments. We can't be solving that ad hoc only after we have built the high-speed rail line. All processes take long. We can be, we can be late. We can, uh, you know, uh, do not use the opportunity. Yes, in Jehlava there have been consultations with inhabitants and they perceive it as a threat rather than opportunity. That's something that Minister Kupka should mm, promote, to tell people that development of a high-speed rail is an opportunity for young people to live in a smaller town. Yes, they can commute and work in a large city, but they want to live with their families in quite a calm, smaller towns. Joe, I've got a question for you. Um, do you have any recommendation for cities who would like to start using uh, cutting-edge technologies? Uh, what do, do you recommend? Preparing a comprehensive analysis of a transport system or have a quality set of data and view it from a wider perspective or should they start implement first steps and uh, everything will follow what approach would you recommend I, I personally take a very um simple approach to these which is start by defining what the problems in the city are and then try and find some technologies that might solve those problems. If you go to any exhibition or congress on smart solutions, there are hundreds of people who invented things that are really exciting and they're desperate to get you to buy the thing that's very exciting. But if it doesn't solve a problem in your city, then it has no value. So I would simply say, what are the problems that the citizens face and are there some exciting solutions out there that solve those problems so that to my mind it, it, it's very simple um but i think it, it, it's the, the best advice and hopefully avoids investment in in technological solutions that might be very advanced but don't need actually yield social benefit thank you joe one more question for you i'm getting back to greater cambridge uh, what kind of recommendation do you have for large or medium-sized cities that have problems with traffic car traffic what uh, wor has worked best in greater cambridge uh, did you ask people what they wanted there's been a range of consultations. So, for example, we've had a citizens' assembly, and one of the things that gave the politicians some encouragement to consider things like road pricing was that the citizens' assembly, which was a an independently run panel, um, asking a, a, a profile of citizens what they thought, came up with the, those ideas. Um, so that was important. But again, it's very important that there is a reason why you are doing what you're doing. So, the Greater Cambridge Partnership. Our focus is to enable the growth of the city. We've got a city where there is a, a strong growth in high tech sectors like um, biomedical activity, and there is not enough housing for the people who work in those sectors. So what we're looking to do is to provide the transport that enables people living in new housing to get to work. It's, it's clear, it's easy to explain. And again, people see that hopefully the transport we're doing is solving problems it's it's not providing new transport for its own sake and i think that's very important that the people understand the problem you can communicate to people the problem nobody will always like every every scheme you do because there will always be people who are impacted by new transport schemes but at least it's important to be able to explain to them why you're doing what you're doing um so again it, it, it's having a very clear understanding what are the problems faced and what are the solutions that will resolve those problems um, and that again I think is really important rather than 
perhaps creating a very exciting transportation master plan top down that is, 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 is exciting and innovative, but when we're maybe not so clear what the outcome of it would be. Thank you. Thank you for this nice summary. Thank you very much, Andrew McNaughton, Joe Baker. Before we say goodbye, let me sum up for our listeners what we've discussed. What I found inspiring was the possibility of using regional lines. There has been lots of discussions in the Czech Republic. Uh, regional lines are set to consume lots of money monies that might be needed elsewhere and now it seems that those lines can be regenerated and um, they may use light tram trains, uh, the existing lines could be used. Uh, what I find interesting about tram trams is their affordability. It's nice that it's yet another solution that can be part of a portfolio, something that opens uh, doors for potential solution of net zero, carbon net zero. We can get inspired by UK. Cambridge, a city has, that has its limits uh, from history, it's definitely not possible to develop more flats, transport options are also limited, but they still try to find a solution, a systemic solution. I like the fact that they consult with local people, that they develop cycling path. Milton Keynes, it's interesting that in the survey they did, 67% of people said that they would like to try an independent autonomous vehicle. The robots that perform logistic functions, I believe you must try it, unless you can't say it won't work unless you try it. Sometimes intuition does not help. People need to have hands-on experience and only after that we can make decisions. Gentlemen, uh, any last remark from you to contribute to the final stage of this debate? Well, yeah, from what you've said, tram trains, I feel attracted by the possibility of using tram trains um, for regional centers, Liberec, Jablonec, uh, Šumava. These places can use tram trains um, because um, tram trains can be used for commuting, but also for tourism. And it's worth mentioning, I think, it's a great inspiration. Tram trains are low cost. Uh, you know, to develop a stop is very cheap when compared to a regular a railway station. Cambridge, I like the fact that they've got a funding pact with the central government. We know that funding infrastructural projects is sometimes difficult because there is not enough taxes uh, when we compare it with uh, the prices of infrastructural projects that are very high. So I feel it's a good idea to create a central plan that will help fund development of mobility in towns and in the long term the money will pay off to the central budget because the project will support mobility, there will be more investment, uh, greater development in the area. It's a, it's a good idea.
takže potom se to na, na daních vrátí. Tam, ber, tam beru za slovo samozřejmě slova pana Absolutely, ministra. Absolutely, that's what minister Kupka said, that it's nice to have a wide spectrum of options and I hope the ministry will financially support cities. Yes, and Milton Keynes, Just a um, small remark, what I find very interesting, and I can see it in Prague too, new mobility options become business cases, and it needs to be regulated. We don't want scooters being all over the place. But it's yet another option to, you know, for startups, for example, to offer new solutions and to support this in business terms. Um, what you said um, uh, regarding recommendations for cities, identify your problem, decide what your problem is and where you're going to go, how you're going to solve it, and use zoning for better reasons. That's uh, great, uh, very important in my opinion. Unless we have a good zoning plan, we can't start implement any project. Michal? It's hard to have add something. You've made a nice summary. I love the principle of municipal lab. Our civilization is so advanced because we've always been trying new things and we keep trying them. And we are using smart things in a smart way, meaning not too fast. So yes, let's have such a place, such a lab. Let's try it. Let's assess. Does it work? Does it not work? Will we proceed with that or not? Just do not take over hastily. Things that we've heard work well elsewhere because you end up finding scooters in the river, yes? So be very uh, patient and think well. It should be part of this process. Thank you, gentlemen. Joe? Andrew, would you like to say a few final words, any recommendation? Now that's the right moment. I would just say um, some of the comments you, your panelists in the room have said, I completely agree with. The starting point has to be defining the problem, not starting with a solution and trying to make it fit the problem. And land zoning, where people are going to live, work, what sort of industries, is the most important subject for a city. Then you can work out how best to connect it up. Okay. Thanks, Andrew. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad we are agreed on the principle of finding the problem and solving it. That's good that we're, we, we, we have no difference on that. Um, and I think the only point which may be we didn't talk about is the, the the disruption that we've seen because of the pandemic the changes in travel behavior and it will be important in the coming years for us to understand the implications but it's too soon sadly in as we know the pandemic is not over and we don't know what the after scenario is going to be but clearly it's something we will have to monitor and learn from and decide how we respond Gentlemen, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you uh, very much. Uh, f thank you for giving us some insight into what's happening in uh, the UK. Uh, you are a great inspiration for us. Uh, your presentations and also this recording will be available on our web page in both uh, Czech and English version. version. So this concludes our third uh, uh, round of discussions that we uh, prepared in collaboration with the British uh, Embassy. It was supported by the British Embassy 
ambassador Nick Archer, and we are grateful uh, to him for this, uh, for his uh, continued support. Uh, gentlemen, thank you very much. I would like to thank our uh, technical team as well. Thank you for coming. Thank you uh, to Check Invest. Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, and goodbye to all of you. Uh, definitely, this will not be our last discussion. We uh, are already considering other topics that we want to discuss in collaboration with our partners from Great Britain and other countries. Thank you and good afternoon.